what I want to do really quick is just explain to you a little bit of what you kind of can expect over the next two days. Um, and then we'll go on from there. We're going to do a fun icebreaker. So inside of your bags, if you've put them in there or if you just grabbed it, you've got a folder. If you'll open that folder up, on the right side, you will see our um, agenda for the conference. So that kind of tells you the order of things and how everything is going to go. And it tells you kind of what you can expect on the right side. And then underneath that agenda, you've got some pages stapled together. And those are notes that, um, as you're following along with Katie, if you want, you can write on those as well. Or you can write on your little notebooks that are at your place setting. So you'll have something to actually write on. Um, what we're going to do is we had hoped and planned and wanted to do a bonfire tonight, but those winds are blowing, which honestly I have to tell you is kind of fitting because we're talking about something new starting now, and I feel like it's the wind of change, right? It's just changing how we're going to do things tonight. So... Um, we've got plenty of dessert. So we are going to socialize right here um, in the comfort of this building without the wind blowing us in the face and without the, ambers, or the embers going all over the place. So no campfire tonight, but it's still going to be an enjoyable time. All right. I want you all to get to know each other a little bit better because you're going to be sitting with these people for the next two days. And we're going to do a little game called Have You Ever? Okay? In front of you, <laughs> there is a little cup, and it has three Hershey's Kisses in it. Don't eat any. Raise your hand if you've eaten one of your Hershey's Kisses. Oh, honesty, I love it. Go give her another one, somebody. Everybody needs to have three pieces of candy in front of them. And I'm going to ask a series of questions. When I ask you the question and say, have you ever, if the answer to your question is yes, you're going to take one of your chocolates out and pass it to the person to your right. If the answer to your question is no, you don't give up any of your chocolates. Does that make sense? So you only move the chocolate to the right if you say yes. Whoever at the table is left with the most amount of chocolates is the winner of a whole bunch of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting, right? All right, are you guys ready to learn something about some people at your table? The first question is, have you ever visited a foreign country? We're going right. Have you ever gone more than a week without shaving your legs? Oh, there's my sisters right there. I love it. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever been to this women's conference before? Oh, we've got some repeat offenders. I love it. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever come to this conference before? Oh, the rule is if you say yes, you move it one to the right. <laughs> and if it's no, you just keep it. Okay? All right, let's see. Have you ever gone two days without brushing your teeth? Yes, we've got campers in the house, don't we? Yep, campers. You can tell who the campers are. <laughs> All right, let's be honest. Have you ever stolen money from your mother's purse? Some of you have your mothers here with you today. So this might be a confessional time. Oh, did you just move that, Anita? Ouch. <laughs> All right, we're going to do two more. Get to know the people at your table. Get to know the people at your table. Have you ever skydived? Adventurous back there. She's like, I proudly pass that one to the right. Raise your hand if you have not said yes to any questions yet. Oh, oh one? You've got the most candy at your table so far, huh? I love it. All right, last question, last one. Oh, you too? All right, last question to get to know each other. Have you ever, at any point in your life, had a piercing below your ears? I like it. <laughs> So there's some of you who probably got to know everybody a little bit more than you maybe already did at your table. Some little fun facts about people you wouldn't have expected. Raise your hand if you're the person at the table with the most amount of chocolates. Oh, Laura. 
over there, <laughs> Lori. <laughs> He's like, I said no yeses. Well, enjoy your chocolates, and now the Hershey Kisses are free game. You're welcome to eat them as much as you want. <laughs> All right, ladies, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to introduce to you um, our speaker, Katie Hawkins. Um, but before I do, I really feel like God has kind of put it on my heart to share something with you. And so I'm going to do it, and it applies to what we're going to be talking about um, over the next couple days with our conference. So when we were starting the planning process for this back in February, um, I was leading AWANA. If you don't know what that is, it is, it stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Afraid. And it is a kids program that we put on here at our church. And it's from three-year-olds to 18-year-olds. It's wonderful. You teach kids the word of God. They memorize scripture. It's beautiful. So I was asked last year in my home group if I wanted to do it. And I said no. There's absolutely no way ever that I want to do that. No thanks. Like every time our group leader would bring it up, I said, nope, not for me. Because I already did a wanna. I did it at our last church, so I kind of felt like my time was served. <laughs> like I already had to deal with the, the teenagers, so like my time was served. So I said, no, 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 no. So we have this prayer, um, time of prayer, night of prayer at our church. And what they did was they brought all the ministry leaders up. And each ministry leader talked about their ministry. They talked about the needs. They talked about the praises. And here comes the Awana commander, the same guy who's my home group leader, and he talks about the needs of Awana. We've got so many people leaving. And then he starts praying over it. And I will tell you right now, as soon as I bowed my head, I said, you know what? Someone's going to step up. Somebody is going to step. Thank you, Lord, in advance for the person who's going to step up. And I, I am telling you, I've only heard the voice of God very clearly probably a handful of times in my life. And it's not like an audible voice that's other than my own. But you hear it within yourself and you know it's not from you. And when I said that, I heard, that's you. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so that would not have come from me because that's not what I wanted to do. And the reason why I didn't want to do Awana is not because I don't like kids. It's because Awana is on Wednesday nights. You know what Wednesday night is? It's the Bible study, right, that I get to listen to pastor, which I love, and it's also date night. Like, we drop our kids off at Awana, and then we go on a date. Like, I didn't want to give that up. So I was like, nope, somebody else will do it. And God's like, that's you. And I was like, oh, my, my head was heavy. And I said, okay, God, if you really want me to do this, if this is you telling me to do Awana, um, make it so that somehow... I run into the Iwana commander before I leave. Not by me trying to find him, not by him trying to find me. We'll just run into each other. And he said so clearly, really, Gideon? Really? If you don't know, Gideon's a story from the Bible, just really quickly, a guy who was asked specifically, like literally the presence of God, Jesus was there and said, you need to do this. I mean, it can't get more clear than that. He physically saw him, and he's like, okay, I understand what you're saying, but can you show me something? Can you show me a sign? And God was like, really, Gideon? And then, of course, what are we doing, CWF this semester? Gideon, of course, right? So I walked up after the prayer was done and after the meeting was over. I literally walked up like this. <laughs> and I just looked at him, and I said, okay. And he smiled. He said, the Holy Spirit convicted you, huh? I was like, yes. And I am telling you, I started this Awana season li figuratively kicking and screaming, kind of literally, because they assigned me to the seventh and eighth graders, right? And I'm like, really? Like, I, my son's not there yet. He's still, like, into Legos. Like, I don't know what to, how to connect with these kids. And the minute I met them, I was like, these are awesome kids. They're such awesome kids. And I said, the reason I'm here is because I need to recognize God was just telling me that it's going to be okay because my son's about to be 13, and he's going to be awesome just like these awesome kids, right? No. The reason why, the reason why he sent me to Awana is for you guys. So it was a February night. The same commander was um, doing a, a teaching for us. He was subbing a teaching. And he was teaching about the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, um, and all those things. And then he looked at these circle of kids, these misfits, and he said, raise your hand if you ever feel awkward in a group if you ever feel out of place, if you ever feel different, if you ever feel weird. And every single one of them raised their hand. And it was almost like that moment in school like where you wait for somebody else to do it. That's what I did. Like I was like, okay, they're all raising their hand. Can I raise my hand too? Because seriously, I feel awkward and weird and different sometimes. And I expected him to say, well, that's okay because you're loved and all this sort of stuff. And he said, well, you are awkward. And you are different, so you should feel that way. And I was like, where are you going with this? And he brought up such a good point. 
He brought up such a good point. He said, God made us all different, and it's for a very specific reason. We have a very specific purpose. He made you that way because your personality, your gifts, your talents, your time, your efforts are all for the sphere of influence that you impact, your family, your friends. And you're special, and you're different, and you're awkward, and you're weird because there's nobody else like you. So in that moment, I heard, I don't know if you guys know it, if you don't have kids, hopefully you'll watch it. But I heard in my, vo in my head the voice of Bob the Tomato and Larry the Cucumber. <laughs> God made you special, and he loves you very much. And I kid you not, when I was talking about, I was thinking about what I should say to introduce Katie. She doesn't like to be talked about. So I was like, what am I going to say? Because say she's amazing, and she's wonderful, which she is. But God's like, just tell them that I made them special, and I love them very much, and I have a purpose, and I have a will for them. And if I had not stepped out kicking and screaming and said, okay, that's not the message I would have brought you tonight. I would have probably lifted her up instead of lifting you guys up and lifting God up. So that's why I'm in Awana, and I actually do really like it. The kids are pretty cool. Um, so it worked out in the end. Now, that being said, um, the reason why this subject is so perfect for Katie to talk about I will talk about you a little bit. Unlike anybody else I've ever met, Katie has this unique gift to um, be willing. And that's a gift, willingness. To be willing to not only hear what God wants her to do, but then step out and obey. And she really does that very well. Sometimes it's kicking and screaming, but she does it. And I am so thankful that she did not have to kick and scream coming here tonight. She, with joyful, happy arms, said, yes, 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 I'll come back. Because she genuinely loves this place, and she genuinely loves you ladies. So without further ado, Miss Katie Hawkins. Am I on? Um, April is so right about the fact that I was so excited to come back here, ladies. Um, I didn't have to pray about it or ask God if it was his will when she asked me. I'm like, yes, yes. Um, because some of you, if you didn't, weren't here last year, you don't know this, but we were stationed out here two different times. And I did come here kicking and screaming the very first time because I honestly thought, the desert would be very dry and lonely and, and boring and kind of empty. And I, I didn't want to come here. But what I found here, wow. Some of the most spiritually significant moments happened out here in 29 Palms. Um, some of the people I met are still the most dearest friends today. <laughs> some of the experiences I had, and then I really fell in love with the environment too, and I was not bored. It's fun out here. <laughs> so, um, so I love coming back. I just feel honored to be here with you again tonight. And I'm very encouraged that some of you that actually heard me speak last year came back. <laughs> Woo! Um, but I wanted to do a, just a quick intro to tell you why um, April and I picked this particular theme. You see this verse all over, it's on your table, it's on your, on your trays, it's in your book, it's on these beautiful posters April um, made. The quick backstory, I have um, a beautiful family, three sons, and their wives, they're all in the military, one in the Army, one in the Air Force, one in the Marine Corps. <laughs> I, yeah, one in each. We begged Molly, my daughter next to me, to go in the Coast Guard. We thought that'd be cool. She's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely not. Anyway, Molly um, lives in New York City. And she has been going through kind of a dark time in her life because she's young and she's just trying to find herself. And she doesn't really know where she fits, and she's wrestling with her faith. She doesn't really know what she honestly believes. She's went through a really, really bad relationship, so she had all that baggage. And New York City, financially struggling. She's had a bunch of different jobs and can't really find her passion. So she was just really in a dark place. Well, in, at the beginning of this year, she calls me up, and she says, Mom, 
I think God talked to me. And I'm like, he did? <laughs> what did he say? And I was surprised she would listen. But, um, <laughs> but she, she said, um, well, Mom, I was, just, I was just sick of being so dark all the time and, and disturbed. And she said, I just cried out, I'm sick of it. She goes, then I went on Facebook. Well, they, God can talk through Facebook. So um, she said, someone posted this verse on Facebook. And um, we have verse 19 up there of Isaiah, but um, verse 18 is really what grabbed her, her attention. Do, do we have that verse on that PowerPoint? Um, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And Molly's like, Mom, it was like it just jumped off the computer <laughs> to me saying, stop dwelling on the past. I am going to do something new. And she was so excited and she said, Mom, I'm so ready for something new. Do you really think God is going to move. I said, oh, yes, I do, because I've been begging him to do something for you, <laughs> you know. And, but then, as I was praising God and thinking about him doing something new for Molly, I heard that kind of that quiet thing, like, I have something new for you, too, Katie. Well, a friend of mine and I started this podcast, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. I'm like, I don't hardly even know what a podcast is. I can't believe I'm actually part of one. Um, but I am. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I know I'm doing this new podcast. It's all new. And, but it was like, no, it's something new in your inner soul, some new freedom inwardly that I am going to be working through you. So you'll hear some of that. Um, throughout this conference, what he's kind of been showing me. So on this podcast, I kind of told that story a little bit about Molly, and I, di I did ask her permission. I'm not <laughs> talking out of school. Um, and I said it on the podcast a little bit, and then we talked about this verse and doing something new, and my podcast partner was given that verse for her son who's going on to college this year, blah, blah, blah. Well, April, out here, listen to the podcast. And so she texts me right away you are not going to believe it. God gave me that verse too, and I've been dwelling on it and so excited, like maybe he has something new for me right now and not when I PCS, but now. And so we started, you know, texting back and forth. Anyway, when she asked me to, to do this again, almost right away, we're like, this is our theme. Because, ladies, whether you're like Molly and you're young and you're trying to wrestle with your faith, you're trying to wrestle with your your skill set, your career, your future, where do I fit, or, or maybe you're in the room tonight, you have relational difficulties or have been through some painful relationships or financial stuff or just issues that you need something new, or maybe you're more like April and you're a little bit older and married kids. I said a little. <laughs> April does ministry, you know, and all involved. And yet, April's like, God, do you have something new for me? Do you, it, it, what, more? Or maybe you're old, like me, like a lot older, and, um, and maybe something new isn't appealing to you because you're like, I'm kind of stuck in my old ways, and I don't know if I want to be challenged with anything new. And, um, and yet... When you hear that, there is a little spark, like, could you have something new for me too, Lord, even at this age? So we felt like this little set of verses is for every single one of us, no matter where you're at. So what we want to do these, these next hours we have together is just unpack these verses. What does it really mean to forget about the past? Or, you know, forget about the former things and quit dwelling on the past. What does that really mean? And he's doing something new now? Hmm. Can I perceive it? 
What, what does it mean to perceive it? How can I understand what he wants me to do, what these new pathways are, when I really can't hear him loud and clear in an outer voice? How can I perceive it? And, and then what about these streams of refreshment, these streams in the desert? Sometimes I'm so worn out, I'm so dry. How does that actually practically work? And so we're gonna lean in and we're gonna unpack that all and, and talk about it. And we're gonna do it through worshiping and through praying and through telling stories. I'll tell you some of mine and you guys will tell each other some of yours around the table in small groups. And we'll share some scriptures and we'll laugh and maybe cry and, me, and eat. That's always important. <laughs> and um, by the end of our time together, ladies, my prayer these months, and I know April's and many of you in this room, has been that God truly, truly will show us something new starting now that he has for us because he does love every single one of you in this room, every single one of us, and he has amazing plans and purposes for all of us, and so these verses are for us. So can we start with worship? Where's our beautiful worship team? And, um, and then get our hearts ready. Do you want to stand up, ladies? You'll be sitting long enough. Never used a wireless pack before. This is kind of cool. <laughs> All right, ladies, let's worship the Lord together.
I just want to be different, yeah.
Thank you for this time of worship, God. I just ask that you would be with Katie as she speaks, Lord, that you would just give her the words to speak, um, that your spirit would rest on this place, Lord, and that you would speak to each one of our hearts a new thing, a new thing you're doing in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. you want to turn your chairs around so you're more comfortable, um, get comfortable. And please know, if you need to get up and go to the bathroom or get more water or whatever, I am not, I love that. It, it, let's just be comfortable and, um, like I said, just kind of unpack these, these verses together, Starting really with um, backing up that verse and starting with forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Truthfully, that is the part that, that grabbed my Molly's attention because she was spending so much time in her head looking back and regretting the things she'd done in this relationship or just rehearsing the wrongs, the things that, you know, this person did her wrong or just thinking back on all the jobs and how this boss was bad and she, if she had done this, then she would have kept that. And even, even going all the way back to childhood and how dysfunctional our home was, being raised by a Marine father and three brothers and the only girl and just, living in the past a lot and just rehashing. We all kind of do that, don't we? There's, there's things that we just don't let go and they, and they fester. Um, I found this quote that I love. To get over the past, you first have to accept that the past is over. No matter how many times you revisit it, analyze it, regret it, or sweat it, it's over. It can hurt you no more. <laughs> Somebody's saying amen. Now, here's the thing. This doesn't mean that you don't have memories. It doesn't mean that there aren't times that it's really important to go back and revisit and, and analyze. And um, I have a degree in counseling. My best friend is a, is a counselor. It's important sometimes to go back into the past and dig around and see what happened to you that got you stuck and everything. So I'm, this is not saying that. This is simply saying, do not dwell so much on the past that it robs you of what you could be doing in the present, and then it's de it determines your future. The past is over. Let it 
Go. Stop dwelling on it. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians. Um, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. In other words, Paul is saying, I've got to forget about the former things. And if you remember Paul, you know, before he came, became a Christian, he was killing Christians and having them put to death. Um, so he had some bad things in his past that he had to just forget about. Don't let that cripple you, he's saying. You know, he had some good things, too. He was like this fabulous religious Jew with all these accolades next to his name. So it's not even just the bad things, but sometimes it's the good things. You, you dwell, dwell, like, oh, my last duty station was so much better than this one. And you, and you live in the, in, the, in the past, and you dwell, dwell, dwell. And he's like, look, this one thing I do, forget, forget about the past and press on toward the goal. Now, the goal he's talking about here is simply becoming more and more like Christ. Because, ladies, that truly is why we're here on earth in the first place. The chief end of man is to glorify God and learn to enjoy him forever. The more you learn to enjoy him, the more you glorify him. And to glorify God simply means to show other people what God is like. To become more and more like him so that when you're going through your your daily life, you're, you're kind of exuberating who God is to other people. Now, some of you are like, that's a high task. He has given us absolutely everything we need for life and godliness to carry out that task. He says, no matter what happened in your past, good, bad, ugly, I will take all that and I will work it all together for good to conform you more and more and more into the image of my son so that you can move ahead. And, and you, can, you can see where I'm heading with you. And you can get out there and you can live out your purpose in life in the first place. Does that make sense? So that's why it's important to just quit dwelling on the past. I, I, I like this little quote. If you want to be happy, don't dwell on the past. But don't worry about the future either. Focus on living fully in the present. As women, we, we do this, don't we? Either the past and our mistakes and la la la, or what's next, you know, the next duty station, then I'll be happier. Or when the kids grow up and get out of the house, then I'll be happier, or if the kids would come back, or whatever. Okay. So the present, now, right now, this verse says, I am doing something new now. What? (laughs) What? What would we want God to do new in us right now? Okay, for starters, and this is huge, 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 because this is where it all starts. God wants to give every single human being a new heart, a new spirit. Not just an old, polished up, self-improved Here, let me try to make you act better. He literally wants to give us a new heart. Now, none of us really want anything new unless we're convinced we need that new thing, right? Isn't that why we have a multi-billionaire, billion-dollar marketing industry? I just made that word up, sorry. Um, A marketing industry because they know that. We're not going to go out and buy new things unless we're convinced we need that new thing. This is not going to be a sales pitch, I promise, but I want to unroll from Scripture why every single human being needs a new heart, a new spirit. Okay, um, let me check my notes. 
when God made mankind. Now, some of you that were here last year, this is going to look a little redundant because I know I did this last year, but I like to start any kind of conference with this because if this, if this isn't understood to a certain extent, to a certain extent, um, then the rest of it is kind of mushy. Okay, so I want, I like to make this really clear. When God created mankind, he made us triune beings, body, soul, and spirit. You, you have a little thing in your notes, but it's a circle, and I like to put it this way so I can kind of um, refer to it. He made us with a body, a soul, and a spirit, okay? And when he breathed into Adam, he made Adam fully alive. Now, in Scripture, there's, there's two different words for life. Life in general means in union with, okay? So one meaning, one word for life is bios, and it means when your physical body is in union with your soul. And if you think of your soul as your mind, your will, your emotions, I added conscience because everyone's given a conscience too. That's part of your, that's part of your soul, okay? Everyone, that, that's your inner man. So scripture talks about the inner man or, um, or oftentimes it just refers to this as your heart. A lot of times we think the heart is really just the seat of emotions. And we equate it just with how you're feeling. But it really oftentimes refers to that whole inner you, to you, that personality. Okay? And your body, obviously, your body, your five senses, your physical. Okay, so when God made Adam alive, he was obviously fully physically alive because his body was in union with his soul. Every one of you in this room tonight are physically alive. Congratulations. You wouldn't be here <laughs> if you weren't, because you'd be dead, okay? Um, but there's another word used for life, and that's Zoe. And that is when your soul and spirit are in union with God's spirit. And so God makes Adam and Eve fully alive. When he breathed into them, the word breath there, breathe, is pneuma, and it's the same word we use for the Holy Spirit. And so he breathed his spirit into Adam, and he was fully alive. All right, now, you all know the story, but real quick, he puts them in this perfect garden, and he gives a loving boundary and says, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he didn't want them to know evil. Everything was perfect. Why do you even need to know evil? Don't eat from this tree. They very clearly understood God's will. But God had given them their own will also. He wanted them to have free will because what kind of relationship is it if you make them a robot? So um, along comes the enemy and tempts them. And bottom line, the temptation is you don't need God. You would be happier if you, you were your own God. If you had autonomy, you would be happier. And Eve is like, hmm, weighs it, and then asserts her own will against God's will and decides she would be better off apart from God. You know what happened. Was she better off? Of course not. <laughs> um, but God had warned them, when you eat of it, you will surely die. They did not drop dead physically when they decided to separate from God. What died was that spiritual union. They were no longer in union with God's spirit. And then they couldn't pass on what they did not have. So every human being from then on was born physically alive, but spiritually dead. So all through the Old Testament times, all through those many, many, many years, you see God continually reaching out to people, continually giving people his standards, his Ten Commandments, um, talking to people in various ways, various times, making provision for people. But you also see repeatedly, all go astray. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. In... Um, 
I said, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, can you put that next uh, scripture up there? Jeremiah. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We all have a measure of self-deception within us, ladies. And um, the heart is, of mankind is deceitful. We love God a little bit, but then, eh, 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 eh. The Apostle Paul says this. Next um, scripture. Jews and Gentiles alike are understand. And, and really what he's saying is religious people, which were the Jewish people at the time, and irreligious people, the Gentiles, they're like. It, formal religion and checking the box really makes absolutely no difference. He says there's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It, it's in our human nature to push God away and not be unified. But from the very start in the garden, God starts with a foreshadowing of how he's going to remedy <laughs> this situation. He made mankind in his image, but then that image was marred when they pretty much said, we'll do our own thing, thank you very much. But he gives a promise right away. I am going to make provision for that image to be fully restored someday in, in my time. Okay, he, he prophesies in um, this next verse, if you can throw that one up there, Ezekiel. And I love this. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to do a whole new thing. In, in the olden days, everything about God was on the outside, and people had to strive, strive, strive. And he's like, all, all go astray. What I'm going to do new is I'm going to take your hard heart out. <laughs> I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you and create new ways of thinking, new desires, new will. I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. How does he do that? Through his son, Jesus Christ. He sends Christ to earth to die on the cross, pay the price for our sins, so that when we trust him and believe him to take away our sin, instead of any righteous acts we think we can drum up, or instead of us thinking, well, I'll earn my way to God, I'll just be a good person. You can be good, but not that good. <laughs> not perfect. Um, and so he sent Christ so that we could be born again. You've heard that term, and I know growing up, I heard that term, I'm like, oh, that's for those wacky, you know, <laughs> Baptists. Sorry, Baptists. But um, <laughs> I, I was, uh, you know, raised in Wisconsin, and I don't know, we, I didn't, we didn't have a lot of Baptists in our town. And um, born again, I thought, well, that's only for certain religions. When I found it was in the New Testament, and Jesus Christ himself is the one who said it, I'm like, oh, imagine that. I was wrong. And, and, <laughs> and, um, and what Jesus was saying, and it was in a conversation with this guy named Nicodemus, and, and Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, mm, am I supposed to crawl back up into my mother's womb? And, you know, Jesus says, what is of the flesh is flesh. In other words, he's saying, I'm not talking about bios. You've been physically, you're physically alive. I'm talking about Zoe. Your spirit needs to be born again. Ladies, I know with a, a crowd this size, some of you are, have not come alive spiritually. And when we are talking about something new right now, first and foremost, would you receive a new spirit? Would you receive the, the Holy Spirit into your spirit that you might be in union with God. And some of you, I know, your heart's beating a little harder. You're like, that's me. 
that's me. But you're not sure. You're like, mm, mm. And what do you do? All you do is mentally assent to the facts that Jesus Christ was God. He came to earth to save us from our sins because we cannot save ourselves. And all you do is bow the knee and say, I want that. I want that. If any of you in the room tonight are thinking, you know what? That's why I came tonight. I need a new spirit. Would you please, please, please see me afterwards? I'd love to pray with you. I have a little gift I would absolutely love to give you because this is the best new thing that God could do for absolutely anyone, okay? Now, some of you are like, all right, well, I received that new spirit. Some of you, maybe last year. Some of you, maybe years and years, you have walked in, a, in union um, with the Holy Spirit. So you're thinking, okay, so what is there new for me? Well, what I want to talk about now is the idea that when he puts a new heart in us, he literally gives us a new mind. There's a new way of thinking about our will. And all of it can bring absolutely new emotions. So let's unpack that a little bit. Let's start with our minds. Scripture says in Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> when, when I first came across that little verse in the Bible, I'm like, well, that might be for someone else. I certainly don't have the mind of Christ because I think really bad thoughts sometimes. Really mean, really ugly. I think thoughts that I'm absolutely 100% sure Jesus Christ does not think. Plus, I don't know squat and Jesus knows everything so what does that even mean that I have the mind of Christ bottom line it doesn't mean when you get saved and receive the Holy Spirit all of a sudden you know everything Jesus knows you think everything Jesus thinks because we still are in these bodies we still um, we still have the propensity to walk in the flesh apart from God but what you are given the reason he says we have the mind of Christ, you are given the ability now to think like Christ, to, to look under the physical, natural stuff of this world and see the supernatural, to, to understand the spiritual more and more and more. You're given a new mind to be able to actually understand Scripture. And truthfully, this I did experience um, when I, many of you know my testimony, so I won't go into it, but I was raised going to church, checked the box. I knew all about Jesus. I knew all the facts. And, um, but I was a wild thing, crazy, smoking, drinking, guys, parties. I lived for fun. Um, and then I started teaching um, when I got out of college in this, in this Catholic school, and there was this nun who talked about Jesus like he was real, <laughs> like he was her best friend, and um, she gave me a Bible. I'm like, okay, I could read the Bible for Lent instead of giving up chocolate. That might be a good idea. I'd never read the Bible. I, I tried reading the Bible. <laughs> What is this? Some of those stories in the beginning are crazy, aren't they? I'm like, seriously? And then, you know, you get to numbers, and I'm like, okay, I'm done. I, I, I'm done. I'm like, I don't know why people think this book is so great. I can't even get, get through, you know. I'm not being blasphemous. I'm just being honest. That is honestly how I felt. Okay, then I go off to Cuba to teach for the Department of Defense, and while I was down there, I got born again. I understood the difference between religion and relationship and I prayed a simple prayer I am a sinner I can't save myself I need you and I was born again all of a sudden I really did have a new mind because I went to a Bible study then after that with these marine wives I will never forget it and we're studying like something in Romans it was like the scripture was jumping off the page and exciting my soul and I'm like where has this stuff been all my life are you kidding this stuff is great 
and, and then I got so hungry for more and more and more and really started reading the Bible and enjoying it. I'm not saying I, I, there's so much I still don't understand. Of course, I'm not. But a new mind, a new ability to actually read Scripture and understand it and get some of the principles more and more and more. You're given the mind of Christ to start valuing the things that Christ values. Um, but here's the trick about our minds. Yeah, we're given the mind of Christ, but we're also told, especially by the Apostle, Apostle Paul, that we have got to renew our minds. And that falls on us. That Yes, he's equipped you with that ability, but what are you doing with that ability to renew your mind? So in Romans, I think that's the next scripture I have up there, um, the Apostle Paul says very, very clearly, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When he's talking about being conformed to, the, to this world, it's like that outer pressure on your mind to be like the world. To, to accept the world's values, to live like the world, to say if the world says this isn't wrong, you can do it if you want to, then I, I conform my mind to that, and I think like that, and I act like that. He's saying, stop that. <laughs> stop that. Be transformed. And that word transformed is the, is the word where we get metamorphosis. And he's saying, let there be an inner transformation, a transformation that comes from the inside. Instead of being a creepy caterpillar, don't you want to be a butterfly that's pretty and flying around? And he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And ladies, cut and dried, very simply put, you renew your mind by reading scripture. To be in scripture is not optional for Christian women. It's got to become a daily habit. No holds barred, no apologies for saying that. You will not renew your mind. You will not um, it, it, be living out your purpose with that strong Christ-like mind if you're hit and miss in scripture. Um, so a new mind. Where am I? I get ahead of myself. <laughs> oh, James says this. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I personally, right now in my life, love this verse <laughs> because I want to have a sound mind. Sometimes I feel crazy. You know, anybody in here ever feel a little crazy and forgetful and like, what? What am I thinking? Hello, yes. And I go, okay, that's not from God. God gave me a sound mind. But the idea of the spirit of fear, ladies, I think anxiety issues and fear is like a rampant um, problem in America today, affecting both Christians and non-Christians. And the reality is there's a lot to be anxious about. There is a lot to fear in this world. There's a lot of evil and wicked and terrorists and craziness. There is a lot to fear. But look what God says. He's already said, don't be conformed to the world. Don't think like the world. And he makes it very clear. I, that's not me giving you that spirit of fear. I've given you a sound mind. You don't need to embrace that fear and dwell on that and live in that. You can choose to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It is a choice. Now, let me um, go back to my daughter, Molly, and give you kind of an example of this. One of Molly's um, issues is anxiety. She has an, a serious anxiety disorder, and um, this whole past year, it had gotten so bad that she couldn't fly anymore because she had had some panic attacks on planes. Well, one plane, the guy next to her threw up all over. So you can... <laughs> That's so gross. And, and the plane was packed. And she could, 
she couldn't move. I mean, they cleaned him. Anyway, you don't need the details. <laughs> uh, you can. <laughs> Sorry, um, TMI. But, but then she would just have this terrible anxiety about flying. And, and I mean, all last year, she couldn't go anywhere. She missed my mom's funeral, and that broke her heart. But she couldn't make herself get on a plane to fly to Wisconsin. She missed a family reunion in Kansas because she couldn't get on a plane. And she's like, Mom, when, when I told you when she called and said, God is doing something new, and she said, you know the new thing I think he's doing, Mom, it wants to do is to free me from this anxiety because it's ruining my life. I can't go anywhere, I, you know. And I said, absolutely, he does, Molly. And so we started doing, you know, just some scripture verses together and just talking more about godly things where she was receiving. And it wasn't me trying to lecture and push it down her throat. She was hungry, more and more hungry for his word and truth because she wanted, she wanted something new. Okay, so this good friend of hers said, um, we're going to, we're going to go to Montreal. She lives in New York City. She said, we're, we're going to fly to Montreal. It's only a 40-minute flight, and it's like, you need to get back on the bike, and it, it's short, and we're going to, I'm going to try to help you conquer this fear. So um, I'm like, yes, Molly, perfect. Fear. I mean, faith, not fear. Faith, not fear. Even, <laughs> not the other way around. Um, if you can even, and she had that verse memorized, and blah, 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 I'm going to be praying for you, just keep remembering, okay, so God in his glorious sense of humor, Molly, they get to the plane to fly to Montreal, it's one of those little teeny weeny planes where you can't even stand up straight, and then the plane is packed, Molly's in the very last seat, and there's no seat for the stewardess to sit in, so the stewardess sits in the aisle right next to Molly, blocking her, and that's when the pan, you know, if you're blocked in, I guess that's when the panic really is worse. And I'm like, how like God to provide the worst possible experience for someone who wants to see whether what God says could hold up. And Molly was completely delivered from that anxiety. And she calls me. It was, yeah, she calls me from Montreal. She's like, I'm free, I'm free, I'm a new woman. And she's so, 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 so excited. Oh, and speaking of... Um, free. Rebecca Lyons wrote a book. I don't know if any of you know Rebecca Lyons, but it, anyway, she wrote a book called You Are Free. And Rebecca suffered for almost two years with a very serious anxiety disorder and depression, and God healed her. And her whole book is kind of about living this free, abundant life. I brought a copy of it if anyone's interested. Okay, but and I gave a copy to Molly. <laughs> Read it. it. But then what happened, it's hard for us to change, ladies. We say we want new things. Knit. Kind of. <laughs> Until it comes to actually doing something new, right? We want God to just drop something new. We don't want to actually have to change our old ways at all to get more of God. So, Maul, and I promise I'm not dogging her. I love her to pieces. But she gets back to New York City after the wild Montreal trip, and she wants to go to church, and she wants to do all the Bible studies that I've sent her, and she wants to get in a small group, but she still has the same old set of friends. She still has the same old habits. She still has the same old very strong pull from the flesh, and she gets back in her old ruts. And then she has to fly to North Carolina. Well, what happened on the plane to North Carolina? Absolute panic. So this Rebecca Lyons that I told you about that wrote that book, we got to interview her on our podcast. And um, I said, Rebecca, in your book, you talk about God literally healing you of this anxiety disorder, miraculously. And I said, I just want to ask you, has it ever come back? I mean, when he healed you, was it like a one time, that's it? And she said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's come back. And she said a few instances, but, but, she said, but I was better equipped this time. And she, and I told her about Molly. I said, because Molly 
seemed to get healed, but then boom. And Rebecca said, faith is like a muscle. If you don't, if you don't work it, it will atrophy. It will not be strong and it will not be ready to be used in a time, in a time of crisis when you need it because you haven't been building it up. Does that, does that make sense? So, um, so the idea, you have a new mind, ladies. You have the mind of Christ. But you also have the responsibility to continually renew your mind. Okay, that's enough about that. Let's move on to will. Oh, don't put that one up there yet. Let me say a little bit about um, our wills. Just a very simple thought that might be new for some of you. Because truthfully, it was new for me about five years into my walking with Christ. <laughs> Someone said this, and it was a new paradigm in my own mind. They said, God does not exist to do your will. You exist to do his. Now, some of you are like, well, of course. But here's how selfish I was, immature, weird, misled. I thought, hey, I've come to Christ now. I have the Holy Spirit. He's my Father. He adores me. Therefore, and I've learned about real prayer instead of just, you know, rotely praying. I'm like, I can ask anything I want, and he's going to give it to me because he's my dad and he loves me. So I started asking for everything I wanted, and I rarely got it. You know, I'm like, I wanted my first duty station to be Wisconsin. Where's my Wisconsin friend? There was a, a recruiting job in Wisconsin. I beg God, I'm so homesick. Give us that recruiting job. Oh, no, off to Paris Island, South Carolina. I'm like, seriously? No. And then this and that and this and that and this and that. And I'm like, I don't think this prayer thing works. <laughs> I am not getting what I want. And when that, when I heard that statement, it was like a new way of thinking about my will. I was trying to use God for my own purposes. But that's not what, why I'm even here on earth. I'm here on earth for him to use me for his purposes. He didn't want me back in Wisconsin. <laughs> why? He knew I'd be just like Molly and go back to all my old ways. <laughs> and I wouldn't have been able to grow at all in Christ if I had gone right back to, you know. Anyway, he had a different plan, a different purpose. So all I really want to say about our will tonight, ladies, is it might be a new thought for you to completely surrender your will to him, to just simply say, thy will be done, not mine. It brings so much freedom. I'm not kidding. It brings so much peace and so much acceptance, and you can lay down all the fighting and all the angst and why, 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 Oh, I thought, that was, I thought that was my pocket. And, and, and say, thy will be done. Okay, you can throw out that C.S. Lewis quote. I thought this was interesting. C.S. Lewis, famous like philosopher guy. I don't know. Anyway, he says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, Thy will be done. Some of you are looking at that like, what? I know. I'm like, what? Bottom line is you can say on earth, thy will be done. I want, I want to be one with Christ. I want to, to be in union with you. And I want to live and exist for your purposes, not my own. Or you can say, heck no. <laughs> and in the end, he will say, okay, you can have your will and it means to be separated from me for eternity. He says, all that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who's, who knock, it is opened. And the point there is, when we lay down our will, and we say, thy will 
be done. We do it simply through prayer, simply through asking, seeking, and knocking. And when we do that, we will receive this emotion of joy and peace that ladies, truthfully, aren't we all after? <laughs>